Good day, everyone. This is Brian Prophet once again coming to you from the Open Source Program Office, welcoming you to another edition of Community Central. Um, we're very happy to have a panel on today, but before I introduce them, definitely want to get through the usual housekeeping notes. This is an interactive section. You are certainly welcome to uh, ask questions using the Q&A tool that is available on the right side of your screen. We uh, feel free to vote on those questions and we'll at the, when we're getting to the part of audience participation, we will uh, go through those questions and answer them by the most voted. So be sure to get your questions in. Um, I'm sure this will be an interesting and fascinating discussion uh, today. Um, we're uh, very much looking forward to it. So I'll get out of the way here and start talking about our guests. I'm very pleased to have with us today. Uh, first off, we have uh, Danielle Bingham from the content marketing team. And Danielle is um, on two organizations that will be we'll be talking about a little bit today here, the Online Community Caretakers and the Conscious Language Project. Uh, joining her today is uh, Rich Bowen. Um, from the Open Source Program Office. Rich is one of the members of the uh, Conscious Language Project um, as well. And finally, we have Joe Brockmeyer, who is from the Marketing Communications Team, um, and he is going to be talking about the work around language that the Word Nerds group has been doing. And as part of this whole uh, discussion, you know, it's going to be really interesting to find out from each one of them you know, what they are doing. So I will just kick it off with the first question uh, to Danielle. Um, can you talk a little bit about the the two groups that you're in um, and, and what your work is with those groups? Sure. Um, first off, the online community caretakers um, is an internal group of uh, individuals who are working toward making memo lists, um, other internal communication avenues, um, a welcoming and inclusive place um, so people can share ideas and without fear of, of judgment and um, try to keep uh, a caring and um, civil conversation. Civil is not the best word, but um, yes, we want to be nice to each other. Um, the um, Conscious Language Project is a completely separate project that I'm on. Um, working with Rich Bowen and uh, Sam Newth, among others. Uh, we are working toward having an inclusive vo corporate voice. So um, Rich is, is going to explain that a little more, um, but I wanted to make sure that everyone understands that these two projects that I'm working on are distinctly different. None bleeds over into the other. Yeah, definitely. And I, I want to come back to that a little bit first, but let's, uh, let's go over to Rich. Um, and Rich, can you talk about more, you know, elaborate more about the, uh, uh, conscious language project that Danielle mentioned? Sure. Uh, this is an effort within Red Hat to make sure that the words that we use in our services, products, documentation, and websites is, is welcoming. And this isn't just about forbidding you to use particular words. It is about consciously choosing words that best communicate concepts. Now, one of the side effects of this is that we have identified some words that you know we'll be talking about during this hour that we want people to avoid using because they are problematic. But uh, the, the drive of the effort is to make sure that words are chosen to be the best words, the most, uh, the most appropriate for the particular situation. Excellent. Okay, thank you. Um, and then, Joe, can you talk about the Word Nerds group and how it interconnects with all of this? Yeah, so um, the Word Nerds group is sort of a uh, collaborative of different people from across the company. It's it's uh, a really good example of the open organization in, in practice where people from different disciplines come together and we try to pull together style guide, a uniform style guide for Red Hat, where, you know, for example, we all agree that uh, we're going to abbreviate February just one way and not five different ways across the company. 
Um, and about a year ago, I want to say, we formed a conscious language working group for specifically uh, problematic language because we felt like that deserved sort of its own subgroup uh, for discussion and things that we wanted to avoid, uh, words we wanted to avoid using or only using in certain contexts in communications throughout Red Hat, whether that's documentation, blogs, press releases, and, and so forth. Basically, when it is the quote unquote official voice of Red Hat language that we want to avoid or use intentionally. Okay, good, great. Thank you all for the explanations. And Danielle, as I said, um, I, I kind of wanted to circle back to a point that you made in your, your introduction. Um, and I think that it's, it's key to this discussion as we move forward because when we were talking earlier, earlier this week, this was actually something that was a little bit fuzzy for me. So can you clarify what you mean by there is no overlap between um, the, the community caretakers and the conscious language group? Sure. Um, as I mentioned before, the conscious language group, as well as Rich and, and Joe specified that this is our corporate voice. This is how we want to present ourselves to the world. Um, the online community caretakers is strictly internal um, to support our associates and other, other Red Hatters um, to encourage uh, an inclusive environment where everyone has a voice on any matter that they choose to talk about. Obviously, you know, they're, they're, these are corporate uh, casual chats and um, and events and stuff. So um, it, we're not the word police. We are not going to tell you that the words you use are wrong. Um, we want to just make everyone feel comfortable in communicating and contributing to the discussions. So those are two distinctly different things. Okay. Now, and the clarification is good. Um, so. Part of the reason why we're having this discussion um, today is that we were looking to have an update on the conscious language efforts. And coincidentally, um, for those of us who are here within Red Hat and anyone outside the company that might be watching, you know, um, yesterday uh, our CTO, Chris Wright, hosted a blog. Um, this will be available on the recording and I'm putting it in chat now for the people who are here. Um, talking about, you know, our progress on conscious language. But, but Rich, um, I, I wanted to kind of go to you with this. Um, and, and can you give us an update on the efforts around conscious language? Back in June, Chris posted the first blog post where he said, we're going to be working on this. And at that point, we really didn't know what that entailed. And so a few of us uh, got together to figure out what the process would be to address this. And we're addressing it on, on several different points. My role on the team is to interact with upstream projects that Red Hat cares about, where cares about is kind of a very broad brush. Uh, these are projects that become our products, but also other things like, say, Python that uh, we don't actually make into a product, but it's very integral to it what we do. Um, and then we started to work on what is the process for approaching these projects? How do we recommend that they address the problematic language that we find in these projects? We also looked at internal documentation and all of our web presences, and we have somebody that's in charge of each one of those aspects of the project. So it's been about six months, and we have drawn up a list of those projects. We've started to address many of them. We are we put together a uh, dashboard that uh, once a week goes down and downloads all of the Git repositories associated with any of those projects and does statistical analysis to see how we're doing on particular words and phrases that we've identified that we want to address. And uh, I'll be providing a link to that in the chat once I'm done talking. And it's a great way to sort of see how we're progressing week to week on this effort. We have a number of, uh, we have a document where we're kind of tracking success stories. 
things like the Linux kernel and MySQL and Ceph are, are particular examples where we've seen real progress over the last six months. Um, there's some other projects that are moving more slowly, and this is intentional because you don't want to break a customer experience by suddenly changing their entire configuration file in a dot release. So people are looking very intentionally at deprecation cycles to make sure that we don't end up uh, doing more damage than good by changing things too quickly. Um, okay. I do encourage you to, to read that blog post. It's got some of those examples in it, and I'll be sharing some more detailed examples in the chat. And uh, in the, I suppose, when people are watching this externally, these links will also be in the video description. They will indeed. All right, that's good. So, you know, Joe, let's, uh, I, I, I want to kind of uh, get you to sort of like like walk us through, if you can, like, the evolution of the the conscious language group within the words word nerds group. I mean, like the approach here um, obviously seems similar. Um, and so, you know, like like where you know what's the take on it um, from your side um, from the word nerds group? Um, so the evolution on, on that side was basically, so the word nerds has been in existence probably longer than I've been at Red Hat, which is going on eight years. And um, historically, the word nerds, we have debates about things like, should we capitalize operator for Kubernetes? Um, should, you know, uh, when can we um, use an acronym for a Red Hat product? The answer is generally never, um, but uh, in, you know, in official writing, and I want to stress that, like, we're not saying, like, this is the language you have to use in your personal life. This is what is the language we should use when writing about uh, writing for Red Hat in some context. Um, so we started discussing a couple of terms, not because they were you know, how do we handle this brand or are they things that shadow man wouldn't say? So we have a whole list, for example, of jargon and words like impactful that we think create a bad taste in people's mouth when they see them because they're just too corporate and icky. And so we ask people not to use them. Um, well, then we started discussing a couple of terms that weren't in those categories that were you know, hey, we think these words might make people feel bad and not just because they're corporate and icky. Um, and so we decided after a couple of sessions that we would split that off into a separate group and that would that would specifically be comprised of anybody who wanted to show up that cares about that particular issue, both because um, those discussions can get a little different than, you know, they are, first of all, they're subjective, they're not, um, well, brand says do this, and so therefore do that. They are a little more subjective, and uh, they have an opportunity for people to feel different sorts of ways. Usually people don't get too invested in corporate speak, um, but may have uh, tempers may flare and things like that when you're discussing um, conscious language. So basically it got split off into its own group and has its own intake form. Uh, or intake process, or things can get referred from word nerds over into that. And I feel like I just talked a lot. No, you're fine. Okay. And I, I certainly approve of the word icky. Um, yeah. Because I, I remember that from marketing class. No, uh -huh. but seriously. Yeah. <laughs> it's a technical term. It's a highly technical term. Exactly. No, but some of you said actually wants me to throw this question out to the group at large, and, and anybody can pick this up, please. Um, you know, Joe mentioned that, you know, sometimes that people will um, be passionate about the reactions, with, with their reactions, rather, um, to efforts, you know, from the conscious language group and, and word nerds. And so I kind of want to ask the panel at large, you know, like, like what, if, what are some of the big challenges have been or what, what have been the most surprising challenges that you have faced in your efforts um, with these projects? 
I feel like the, the biggest pushback that we've got is from people who feel that we are um, attributing motive to them. Um, a lot of open source projects, you know, to, to pick a term, use the word slave, and it is it is used innocently. It is not used in a way that is intended to cause harm. But when we come in and say, you need to consider changing this term, people assume that we're assigning motive to them, that they used it intentionally to harm people. And that's that's simply not the case. We're looking out for the next generation of users and developers on a project trying to be more welcoming. We're not trying to criticize those that came before. Um, and we're, we're participating in this effort. We're not saying thou shalt. We are participating in the effort to change these things. We're taking ownership of it and admitting that, that we are part of the problem. Okay. Panelists, any other thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, I'm going to follow up on, on Rich's comment um, that some of the discussions that we've had um, on memo list, uh, most recently in response to Chris Wright's post in, in June, as a conversation that still that still continues, um, is that discussions have been, um, I don't want to say veering off, but they've been moving away from the intent of the project um, to micro-analyze um, the words that we're including, say, master, slave, whitelist, blacklist. Uh, master seems to be popping up at the top of, of the subject. Um, and there's so many other ways of using master. We have master degree. We have a master document. We've got a master recording. Those things it is not even part of the scope of the Conscious Language Project. And so we want people to understand that this is all, um, this is all focused on specific words used in specific ways and making that um, sound more inclusive or become more inclusive. Um, I just want to say, so when when we started doing this, um, maybe it was January or even late last year, um, we had, you know, started advice on master slave and blacklist allow list. And so I actually had some blogs in the queue that used some of these terms. And at first I had a great feeling of dread having to go to the authors and say, uh, I'm making this change for these reasons. I want you to agree to this change for these reasons. And was really concerned that I was going to get a lot of pushback. And in fact, I did not. Um, the folks who had written those blogs um, basically came back with, sure, what do you recommend? Uh, and it became a problem of not doing great violence to the language, coming up with alternate terms as opposed to yeah, I'm going to disagree with this, um, which was a, I don't mind going toe to toe with folks about a change if it's important, but um, I'd rather not. And uh, so it's always a delight when I suggest a change that might be controversial and instead people embrace it and say, hey, yeah, that's cool. Like either, you know, and I don't know if the authors um, care or not, or we're just agreeable to changes. Um, but that's always just a welcome attitude when folks are like, yeah, I understand I'm, pu I'm putting this on a Red Hat property, not my personal blog. I'm not being asked to censor myself in my own home. I'm being asked to adhere to preferred language in a corporate context, which is really important. And I think it's also important to uh, mention that in our, in my particular effort, and I'm sure in everybody else's effort in the Conscious Language Project, in discussing this with other owners um, of particular pages, properties within Red Hat, we've gotten overwhelmingly positive response in and eager to help, eager to to um, bring 
inclusivity into um, Red Hat's corporate language. So that's very, very heartening. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's all. That's all certainly true. And 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 there's a comment um, uh, in the chat right now um, that I want to kind of read out so people watching the recording can hear it uh, from Catherine, who says some pushback sounds like you can't just eliminate words from the language. And Catherine thinks that the point here is we can be intentional about the words we choose to use. And that feels like something that we could all agree on here, correct? Yeah, I think so. Absolutely. And there's there's no effort here to, to eliminate words. There is an effort mm -hmm. to make sure that words are used where they're most appropriate, where they are most useful. And conversely, to choose the correct words in in uh, you know from from the the angle that I'm working in the project to use the words that best describe the technical aspect of the software that we're talking about. Um, we've had a number of comments from people for whom English is not the first language. This is a, a really frequent comment. People say when I first started working with software, or say disk hardware, and I saw the word slave, I found it perplexing because it doesn't accurately describe the technical situation that's being discussed and 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 that 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 provided a barrier to them in understanding the functioning of the software and so there's there's not only the aspect of of slavery being problematic there's also the aspect that the word's just not the right one in almost every situation Okay, and then, and then I'm gonna pause a little bit, and we'll do this. Normally, we do Q and A from the audience at the end, but since we're having more of a round robin discussion, I, um, there's a question from Marcus that applies to just what you said, and he asks, "I've heard that Git moves or should move away from master branch in favor to origin branch, um, origin branch." And he is asking, "Isn't this over the top? The master branch has." Uh, I believe he was trying to say derivatives. I apologize if I got this wrong. So this is no relation to slavery at all. You know, what is the panel's take on that? Um, like you were going to say something, Joe. So I'll <laughs> I, I was actually uh, somebody is walking through the hallway. I wanted to stop them before they leave the house, actually. <laughs> um, but I do have something I wanted to say to that too. Um, I I don't have a strong opinion on whether or not that's over the top, um, but I will say that I don't have a strong objection to link away with the term master in favor of origin. Um, if I understand Git correctly, uh, neither term may be 100% accurate because you may actually, you know, the, the master for a Git or the origin for a Git repository can change. Um, you know, so the origin, so for example, Rich and I are both uh, members of the ASF, and the origin for a Git repository for a Apache project might be hosted by Apache, or it might these days, I think, Rich can correct me if I'm wrong, be hosted on GitHub. Um, and so the origin may actually change over time. So neither term may be 100% correct, and so um, I don't have a strong opinion on it, and I don't think it's worth having a strong opinion on. Um, words change over time. I've been uh, went to journalism school, and somewhere in my boxes of stuff, I have a AP style guide from 1995, which is now firmly obsolete and twice the size. Uh, and so uh, I've been asked to change, you know, my opinion and use on many words over time for different reasons. Um, so I don't think it's over the top, and I think it's a perfectly cromulent use of the word uh, origin now. Okay. I'd like to jump in um, real quick. That um, our, our goal is to address the context of the words. If if the context demands that a particular word be used, then by all means, we need to use that. Um, I think the gray area comes from 
different interpretations of what the context is and finding out exactly what the best word or term is. And that's very, it's, it's very subjective. It is, it is very malleable and there's, there are no hard and fast rules. So like Joe, I also do not have a strong opinion on, on whether, you know, that's going to be over the top. It, it is really, for the most part, on a case by case basis and we evaluate each situation or each term within its context. Um, the, the word master, as Danielle is saying, is used in many, many contexts. And, and there's some places where it seems like it absolutely should be changed. And there's some other places where it may in fact be the right term. Um, we frequently get asked, um, what what's the end game here? What's the, the slippery slope? If I have to change this word here, am I gonna have to change this other word over there? And I I like to look at this differently. I hope that we always consider what people say about words that words and phrases that make them uncomfortable and that, that we try to communicate better in ways that don't. This isn't this isn't a checkbox. We're not gonna get to the end of this process and say, Great, we've done all the conscious language. Now we can move on to the next project. Language, language changes. It's a feature. Uh, the the word awful, as you know, is a 17th century word that means glorious and worthy of praise. And that's not true anymore. Language changes, and we must change with it if we wish to communicate effectively. Okay. Well, now I learned something. Because <laughs> I did not know that. That's good. But but kidding aside, so I I, I kind of wanted to throw out another question to the group at large, um, and we are getting some great questions from Q or from the audience in Q and A, and keep those coming in. We really appreciate it. But before we get to that, real quick, you know, for people in Red Hat and also the people outside of Red Hat who may be watching this, um you know, and are, are thinking about doing a similar initiative within their smaller communities or whatnot. Like, what advice could you give them um, to get this going, um, given the challenges and, and, and all the obstacles and things that you've faced so far? What would be your best advice for someone to get this uh, kind of initiative going? And it's up to everybody. Well, I have, I have two answers for that. I'm sorry, well, Rich, Danielle. Joe, and then Danielle. No, go right ahead, Rich. Okay. <clears throat> one of my one of my answers is that we've written a document about this. Um, it, we have a we have a uh, best practices document on on GitHub that we encourage you to read with your community and figure out how to analyze whether there is a problem and how to address it. And uh, I had something else clever to say, but it slipped my mind. So go ahead, Danielle. Sorry, Rich, I must have done that. Um, my, my comment to this is that I think the, the first step needs to be sharing of the intent, um, getting people to share the, the effort, share in the effort to have that uh, common understanding of what they want to do, why they want to do it, and how they're going to do it. Is, is so important in getting people to understand and contribute to those changes. So it really is a matter of educating and bringing people um, on board and include other points of view um, in, in the Red Hat way, in the Red Hat collaborative way, um, to make sure that everybody understands our purpose and, and our goals. Um, I think. Yep. Let me let me say the thing that I was going to say. Um, if if you remember five ten years ago, codes of conduct were extremely controversial, and uh, if if your project didn't have one, people weren't terribly concerned. If you tried to create one, people would get angry. Uh, 
now people don't want to engage with communities that don't have a code of conduct. This is just the way the industry is going. The same thing is happening with conscious language. This is not something that we are doing all by ourselves on top of our, our pedestal somewhere. We're in cooperation with Microsoft, uh, Google, the Linux Foundation. Um, one of the links that I'll be providing later is, is kind of an industry consortium where we're all working together to come up with common standards. This is something that is affecting the entire software industry. And, uh, you know, it, it, it may be that you don't feel passionately about it yourself, but this is the way that, that things are going. And if I could jump in and say, yes, uh, we are also working with IBM. When I hear Rich say this is the way I expect, you know, like a <laughs> baby Yoda to pop up. Yeah. We don't have props on Community Central. Yet. <laughs> Yet. Yes. Um, Thank you. Oh, can, Joe, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, if we're, if we're done, I'd like to tackle this question from uh, Reggie. Yeah. About. Um, Go ahead. We can, I can, let me, let me ask it for the benefit of the audience. So Reggie asks, how do we limit personal and regional context when passing judgment on words, you know, like, are they good or bad? For instance, American versus European versus Asian context of using language. So that is a great question from Reggie. Thank you. So what, what would be your answer panel? Um. I, I think so a couple I have a couple of thoughts on that, which number one is that I would really love to see admittedly uh, the word nerds group is primarily North American and we do have a strong you know uh, representation and uh, context for North American discussion. Not surprising given that we are given that we are headquartered in North America and that, you know, we do a lot of our business in North America. Um, I think that um, we should default to the kindest language that we can choose. So, for example, if a term is considered offensive in a region but not in another, default to the kindest implementation of language that you can pick. That would be my first thing. So maybe, you know, master slave are not offensive to people in, you know, a region or a country. That's fine. Default to the kindest thing. You know, what would one of my mantras, I should not use that term, uh, but one of my mottos is, you know, what would Mr. Rogers do? Which, again, probably doesn't have a lot of context for people outside of North America. But, you know, basically pick the nicest thing to do and do that. Um, and the second thing is I'd really love to have more participation for people outside of North America. If there are terms that we use, I would be loathe to choose terms that are offensive in, say, Japan, um, but not here that I don't know about. So if there's somebody in Europe that, you know, or, you know, Asia or wherever that um, is aware of language that we use that's problematic or difficult in other languages, I'd love to hear it. One of the non, uh, you know, one of the considerations that isn't about conscious language so much is are we writing in a way that people who speak English as a second language can understand it easily? Um, are we making cultural references that are just obtuse for people who are not native English speakers or not North American? Um, so I'd, I'd like to increase the amount of participation we get from people in other contexts and languages. Um, and there may even be room for, you know, are there words when we do translations that shouldn't be used in other contexts? Mm -hmm. That is a really good, uh, that's a really good segue to a story I'd like to share. Um, some time ago, uh, we had been doing a lot of content for digital transformation. That is, that is, I believe that's the theme for this quarter uh, on Marcom. Um, and in discussions with some localization folks, we discovered that the French uh, language uh, sees digital transformation as something completely different than our intended meaning. Um, 
it, it literally means moving your fingers or changing your fingers. So this, you know, while innocuous, this is definitely something that we have to be mindful of in all of our language and all of our terminology. So um, you get some humorous uh, translations, but you can also get some um, troublesome transformation or, or translations. So uh, it, it really is um, that localization and and uh, making sure that all languages are are addressed is really um, is is really important as much as we can. Well said, everyone. So we do have a, a one remaining question from the Q&A. There have been um, a number of questions that have point asked about specific links to documents and resources. Um, we are definitely going to gather those and share those with, you know, as many people as we can, um, you know, after the broadcast when we post the recordings. Um, but there is a question from Blaine who asks, have you received pushback from some communities or individuals when seeking to make more inclusive and less harmful language changes? For these situations, what has been helpful in explaining why these changes are positive? And that's to the group. Rich, I think you probably are more qualified to answer that particular question since you've been um, involved in some really great conversations specifically on memo list. I, I think that the the important thing here is to believe people when they tell us that words and phrases are are othering, that words and phrases make them feel like they're outside of the group, like they are less welcome in the community. Um, it's not a question of seeking proof that a particular term is problematic. It's not a question of um, forbidding certain words and phrases. It's a question of knowing your community and listening to them when they tell you these things. Uh, so it, it's it's a hard question. Yeah, we've gotten we've gotten pushback. We've gotten pushback uh, from people who feel that we want to be the language police, that we are instituting new speak. Um, you know, there's a variety of ways that this is phrased. But if your goal is to choose words that explain best, then it's not really a question of of trying to be the word police. It's a it's a question of trying to communicate efficiently. And as as a writer, as a as a documentation person, this is this has always been my goal in all the years that I've been involved in open source is to communicate most effectively and to most audiences. And if if we are choosing words that that uh, marginalize a small part of the audience. It doesn't have to be 75%. It just means that we need to seek words that communicate best to everyone. Okay. Um, and a related question from Shlomo who asks, what is the threshold for accepting that a particular term is problematic enough to warrant changing? And I, and I know you sort of addressed it at the yeah. beginning, Rich, but you know, what, what, you know, how do how do we as participants in a conversation, you know, get through that, um, so to speak, and, and know when it's enough? Well, my my threshold is that somebody tells me that it that it, that it bothers them. Mm -hmm. And also, along with that, that there's a better choice to be made. And those two things together are, to me, the threshold. Okay. All right. And then uh, we have a comment from Frank uh, to support the earlier. There was an earlier question in the Q&A about do we have a dictionary of terms that are considered to be problematic? Um, we will have the link to that in, in the resources for the video. Um, but getting back to that question, Frank says, you know, as a non-native English speaker, I find it increasingly troublesome um, to enter discussions about sensitive emotional topics. It is somewhat hard uh, to impossible to keep up with the German way of being politically correct. And he, Frank, emphasizes the need for a dictionary, presumably in German. Um, and 
or perhaps still English, but that may get to what Joe was saying earlier about we need more participants from more places. So we have a huge diversity um, involved in this conversation. Would that be a fair assessment panel? Um, yeah, so I mean, all of these efforts do produce, you know, we don't just talk and then say, um, we're going to point and laugh when you use these terms incorrectly or point and chide, I guess would be a more appropriate in this case. Um, and in, you know, in my role, um, I don't hold it against people for using terms that we've decided maybe we have better alternatives for. I suggest a change. Like that's my literally part of my job is when I get writing that's supposed to go out is to go back and say, hey, we're going to change this. Um, and I try to collaborate with people on that when it is an optional change. Um, so I don't think people should feel too pressured, especially uh, non-native speakers. Um, I feel like, you know, it's simply a matter of um, when it's pointed out that a term is suboptimal or usage is incorrect or whatever, just try to make a mental note for next time. Because I don't think anybody should be pointing fingers at folks who are non-native speakers and trying to shame them or anything. It's a, it's a matter of education. It's just like uh, if I go to Germany and I use the wrong word for something, I would hope that uh, one of my German friends would say, you know, when you asked, you know, for this, you actually asked for something really embarrassing. Um, I, I hope they would uh, correct me and I could try to use the correct German term the next time. Yeah. One of the difficulties with this project is that there's not necessarily a right answer. Um, you used slave, now you should use this. It, 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 and it, it depends on context. And this, this, is, this is in the name of our project. It's, it's conscious language. It's find the term that is best and most descriptive in the situation. And that can be really frustrating if what you're looking for is a said expression that I can do S slash slave slash whatever and apply that to my entire Git repo. And uh, there are some cases where you can do that, but, but in most cases you have to actually sit back and think, what is the best way to communicate the concept that I'm trying to get across here? Yeah, all, all very good points. Well, we actually are coming up to the end of our time um, as we as we do with Community Central um, and always hate to cut off uh, the conversation. There is a very active conversation going on in chat right now. Um, and we'll, you know, we will definitely want to follow up on a lot of this uh, information to that end. Um, it, it is worth um, emphasizing here that links to the, the organizations, the word nerds, the conscious language group, the online community caretakers, these are all three organizations that have been represented by our panel here today. We will have links to those groups uh, available for those of you who are working for Red Hat. And for those of you watching from outside Red Hat, we'll try to include resources that are more um, open source community uh, spanning. Um, and that you can join the conversation there because this is an ongoing conversation um, that we are having within the, the broader open source community. And it's certainly important and it's great to see a lot of passion around this discussion. Um, so with that, um, thank you all panelists for coming in today and talking to us about the efforts that your groups are doing. Uh, we really appreciate it. Thank you very much. It's, it's really great to be able to share our efforts um, and to get some, some great feedback on that. Thank you so much. Thanks, Brian, for facilitating this and for everyone that participated in the, in the conversation. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. All right, great. So with that, that wraps up another edition of Community Central. Tune in again soon for another topic of conversation around open source, open source communities, and community best practices. Until then, be safe and have a wonderful day.